Good evening. Look into the southern sky after dark, and there, fairly high up, you will see the red planet Mars, shining more brightly than any star. When Christopher Duarte took this picture a few weeks ago, Mars was in Leo the Lion. Now it's moved into the adjacent constellation of Cancer, the Crab. But you can't mistake it, because it is so bright, and of course very red, which is why it's named in honour of the God of War. Mars came to opposition on February the 12th. By that, I mean that on that date, the Sun, the Earth and Mars were lined up with the Earth in the mid-position, so Mars was opposite to the Sun in the sky and well-placed for observation. But of course, you do need a telescope of some size to see much on it, because Mars is a small world, diameter only just over 4,000 miles, not much more than half that of the Earth. It's also less massive, only one-tenth as massive as the Earth, and it doesn't pull so strongly, so it's lost a lot of any atmosphere it may once have had. And today, the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that we couldn't breathe it, and made up chiefly of the unbreathable gas carbon dioxide. Also, Mars doesn't come to opposition every year. It's further away from the Sun than we are. We, on average, are 93 million miles from the Sun. Mars, just over 141 million. So Mars has a larger orbit, and it travels more slowly. So the year on Mars is equal to 687 Earth days, which is 669 Mars days, or sols, because Mars spins around more slowly than we do, and the Mars day is equal to 24 and a half hours. So Mars does not come to opposition every year. Let me show you why. Let's begin in an opposition position, as we were in February. Sun, Earth and Mars. One year later, the Earth has been right round the Sun and has come back to its original position. But Mars hasn't had time to do that. It's wandering on the other side of the Sun. The Earth has to catch it up, so to speak, and that takes, on average, 780 Earth days. So the next opposition won't be until March 1997. But that's going to be a better opposition than this one. Our path around the Sun is practically circular. That of Mars is not. The distance varies by quite a bit. And we have to wait for the best oppositions when Mars comes to what we call perihelion, is closer to the Sun, and opposition at the same time. And that will happen in the year 2003, when Mars will be at its very closest and not much more than 35 million miles away. And we'll see it then a great deal better than we have done this year. But even this year, you know, I've seen quite a bit on it. And with my 15-inch reflector, I made a drawing a few nights ago, and there it is. And we can see there the main features of Mars. By the way, I've drawn this with south at the top, because that's the way telescopes show it normally. And at the bottom there, you will see the North Polar Cap. And that looks like ice, and that's exactly what it is. Mars does have ice capped to the poles, and they wax and wane with the Martian seasons. The ice is not quite the same as ours. It's a mixture of ordinary water ice and carbon dioxide ice, but ice it is. Most of the planet is reddish, and that's what we call desert terrain. Not sand, like our Sahara. It's uh, oxide stuff, reddish oxide stuff. Mars is a rusty kind of place. And what about those dark features? Well, originally, they were taken to the seas. But we now know there can't be any surface water on Mars. The atmospheric pressure is too low, and water would simply evaporate. Neither are the old seabeds filled with vegetation, as we used to think. In fact, they are merely areas where the winds in the thin Martian atmosphere have blown the thin, dusty stuff away, exposing the darker material underneath. But those markings are permanent, and they've been seen for a long time. In fact, this was the first drawing of Mars that showed anything very much, made way back in 1659 by the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens. And that V-shaped feature there is the most prominent feature upon Mars. Nowadays, we call it the Certis Major. But in 1877, the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli made new maps of Mars, and here are two of them. But he also drew straight, artificial-looking lines that he called canali, or channels. And there's a Schiaparelli drawing. And Schiaparelli didn't know what these things were, but the American astronomer Percival Lowell was quite definite. And there's Lowell with the big telescope he set up at Flagstaff in Arizona, a 24-inch refractor, and I may say, a telescope I know very well indeed. And Lowell believed those channels to be artificial canals dug by the Martians, whatever they might be, to pump water from the icy poles through to the equator where the inhabitants lived. Now, had those drawings been accurate, then Mars would have been inhabited. But we now know they were not. The canals don't exist. They were tricks of the eye. And 
I can't resist showing you a drawing that I made of Mars with Lowell's telescope some time ago, showing again the North Polar Cap, the V-shaped Surtis Major, and the Red Deserts, but no canals. They were, I'm afraid, figments of the imagination. But our knowledge of Mars has grown amazingly over the last few decades. In the 1960s, we had the first unmanned probes there, the Mariners. In 1971, Mariner 9 went round and round Mars and sent back magnificent pictures showing craters, valleys, and dead volcanoes. And then, in the mid-1970s, the two Viking probes actually played controlled landings there and sent back information direct from the surface. And these various probes have told us most of what we now know about Mars. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back one of our regular visitors, Dr. Peter Catamol, one of NASA's principal scientific investigators. Peter, welcome back to the sky at night. In view of what we've learned, what do we now know about Mars? What's it like? Well, our modern view of Mars, Patrick, is that it's a frozen, cratered wasteland. It has geological features that have been active in the past, as it were, but at the present day, if you look at it, really all you see is the activity of the wind. So when you see a Viking image showing, let's say, the Surtis Major, you can actually see impact craters showing through in both the deserts and the Surtis Major. And the Surtis Major is simply a region of the barren Martian crust swept clear by the strong Martian winds. That these winds exist you can see particularly in the polar regions because around the poles there are extensive dune fields, far more extensive than those that we have in the Sahara on Earth. They're typical dunes. They are where the dust is carried around the Martian poles by the wind. Uh, we can see the dust actually piles up in the lee of things like impact craters uh, and in some Viking pictures this is very clear and you can see striations on the surface of the dust that show that the winds, although the atmosphere is quite thin, are actually quite strong. And in fact, when the Mariner 9 probe reached Mars in 1971, if you'd been looking at Mars from the Earth, you'd have seen virtually nothing because the disk of Mars was completely opaque. The dust covered up all of the surface markings. Uh, in addition to the geological activity of the wind, we have the activity of polar caps, which of course you can see from Earth. Um, the caps actually melt with the seasons as the summer progresses. So if you have a large polar cap, as you have here at the top of the planet here, um, as the season progresses and summer takes hold, the cap will shrink as the ice melts. And that releases volatiles into the atmosphere, which enter the geological cycle. But things haven't always been the same on Mars, have they? Well, they certainly haven't, because if you look at a, a current Viking image of Mars, you look at the whole disk, or half the disk at least, you'll see enormous volcanoes, like these three dark masses of the Tharsis Montes on the left of this picture. You see an amazingly large equatorial canyon system, showing that the Martian crust has been pulled apart by internal heat from inside Mars. You see a whole variety of features which tell us that Mars has been active in the past. And if you were able to, to get in an imaginary probe and actually fly above the surface of Mars, you'd be in for a real treat. You would start off perhaps by flying over the Valles Marineris, a huge canyon. It is cut into the cratered and fractured plains of Mars, the oldest part of the Martian crust. And this covers vast areas of the southern hemisphere. If you entered the Valles Marineris and flew straight above it, you'd see it was exceptionally deep, up to four miles deep and about 120 miles wide, about ten times the size of the Earth's Grand Canyon. And that emerges into the area of Tharsis, a huge bulge in the Martian crust pushed up by internal heat. Because it's pushed up by internal heat, it's the site of enormous volcanoes. These ten times the size of those we have in Hawaii. And at their summits you see volcanic calderas, just like those of Hawaii, but very much bigger. And these volcanoes spread out enormous quantities of volcanic material over the surface. We're not quite sure when. They may have been active up to about 200 million years ago. What about other surface features? I mean, have there ever been any, any oceans on Mars, do you think? Well, this is one, one of the most interesting areas of modern research. Um, if you look at a, a map of Mars in terms of its altimetry, and I should say this map isn't the real shape of Mars, this is a, a sinusoidal uh, projection that allows us to put both hemispheres side by side, we find that the lowest part of Mars is the northern hemisphere, shown here in blue. And it's roughly two kilometres on average lower than the rest of the planet. So when you look closely at the boundary between the two hemispheres, you see certain features which are quite telltale. For instance, on the southern part of the planet, you see here um, channels which seem to be flowing across the ancient crater terrain. North of the line of the dichotomy, you see smooth material which uh, seems to have been laid down possibly by water. And therefore, it's possible that the northern hemisphere of Mars was covered by an ocean, perhaps something between 30 and 50 metres deep.
So we can actually see now the channels cutting through the ancient crater terrain that probably filled up the low-lying basin. Indeed we can, and they're enormous, some of them, showing that water's flowed at an enormous rate. Indeed, if we map the channels that exist on Mars, a surprisingly large number. Here you see a map of the channels, and the, the biggest systems are these blue ones, which you see towards the centre top of this picture. And these amazingly large channels seem to focus on the area we know as Chrysi which is the impact basin, of course, on which the Viking One lander landed. And this picture of uh, the Chrysi Basin shows us what seems a fairly normal lava plain with blocks, but quite large areas of Chrysi are in fact covered by smoother deposits. And one of the largest channel systems that brings material to Chrysi is this region known as the Kasai Vallis, a channel system 100 miles wide and about 1,200 miles long. And here you see a part of the floor showing where the rapidly moving water has scoured around impact craters and other remnants, scraping the channel floor clean. In other places of scour marks, even more clear, and you can see this digging in to the floor of the channel. Uh, when you get to the end of the canyon systems, you can see what they have deposited. Here is that same area of the dichotomy. You can see channels coming in from the right-hand side of the picture, debouching onto the lower ground to the north. And you can actually see how smooth is that material. And this appears to be sedimentary rock, material one from the upland hemisphere. And sedimentary rock is associated with water and the activity of water. So even though the climate is too cold now, in the past it may not have been. And at the channel mouths, you can see where the sediment is spread out. And in some places, and this is the most pungent or cogent piece of evidence, you actually see what seem to be shoreline deposits, as though the uh, sand or whatever it is was deposited under a layer of standing water, which sort of leveled it off. So our, our sort of modern idea about Mars is that when the channels were flowing, and we don't know when this was, perhaps 3,000 million years ago, if we were to, to look down on the northern hemisphere of Mars, we would have had channels flowing in to the northern lowlands, bringing water into that lowland hemisphere and filling it to a depth of perhaps 30 or 40 metres. Now that ocean couldn't have stood long in a, in a liquid state, and it may have existed there for quite long periods, but under a cover of ice. And of course the ice now has melted because the climate's changed. Peter, the volatiles are not there now, so what's happened to them? They certainly haven't escaped into space, so where are they? Well, they seem to have gone underground, and the, and the evidence for this comes from, strangely, impact craters. Um, if you look at a standard small Martian impact crater, it has ejecta with a radial pattern around it because it's just involved dry material being thrown out of the cavity. On the other hand, if you look at larger impact craters on Mars, they're rather different. Their ejecta are more lobate, and the difference stands out strikingly where you put the pictures side by side. And the reason we believe the larger craters have this lobate pattern is that the larger impacts penetrated deeper into the Martian subcrust and released ice that was trapped below the surface. And the <coughs> reservoir for that ice we believe to have been the very fractured bedrock of Mars, the impact smashed bedrock that forms most of the Martian surface. And in the fractures and pores in that material, water was probably collected. As the climate changed, it froze. And we then have a source of volatiles there, which could be there for very, very long periods. So we have learned a great deal about the surface of Mars. Peter, thank you very much. But what about this all-important question of life? Well, for a long time now, we've relegated Lowell's brilliant Martians to the realm of science fiction. And certainly, we're quite sure now, and have been for a long time, there's nothing so advanced as a blade of grass. But is there any life at all? In the 1970s, two Viking probes were sent to find out. They were identical. Each was made up of an orbiter and a lander. They crossed space together and were then separated. The orbiter went round and round Mars, sending back information, acting as a relay, and the landers came down on the Martian surface in controlled touchdowns and sent back information direct from Mars in a concentrated search for any trace of life. Well, they dug trenches in the Martian soil, and here's the trench dug by Viking One. You can see it there. They scooped in material from the red surface, drew that material inside the spacecraft, analyzed it, and sent back the results. And, you know, I think most people, including me, expected to find some trace of life there, very primitive organic material. Well, we didn't. Uh, the results were a bit contradictory. There's something rather strange about Martian chemistry, but certainly there was no indication of any organic activity there, and I think most people are now coming to the rather reluctant conclusion at the moment there isn't any life on Mars.
Of course, we can't be quite sure. Bear in mind, we've only got results from two sites. One is the Golden Plain of Chrysi, where Viking 1 came down, and the second is the Polar Plain of Utopia, where Viking 2 came down. But in each case, the results have been that Mars appears to be sterile. Whether it's always been sterile is another matter. It may well be that when Mars was a more friendly place than it is now, life gained a foothold there and simply died out or went deep underground when conditions became hostile. That we won't know until we actually get samples back from the Martian surface to analyze it in our laboratories. And that'll be done with sample and return probes, and they should be launched in the foreseeable future. And I very much hope we'll get results of that kind before the end of our own century. But of course, there have been other results too. And um, the orbiters took pictures of Mars, and one picture really has caused a great deal of amusement, and there is the famous Martian face. Just look at it. Well, of course, it is merely a chance arrangement of light and shade on a perfectly ordinary rock. You can imagine what the eccentrics made of that one, the flying sorcerers and the astrologers in full cry. But I very much fear it is merely a rather interesting natural formation. And we should have further observations of it before very long. We have, of course, had one major failure, and that was Mars Observer. The American probe scheduled to go round and round Mars and map the surface in much more detail than had been done before. But uh, when it got near its target, it went out of touch, and touch was never again. So we don't know what happened to a Mars Observer. It was an onboard fault, obviously. It may be going round Mars. More likely it's going round the Sun. We don't know, but uh, certainly that's got to be written off as a failure. But at the end of this year, another Mars probe is going to go up, and we hope will do what Mars Observer failed to do. But the Russians also have had their failures. Mars has got two tiny satellites, Phobos and Deimos. They're both very small, they're not a bit like our moon, they're almost certainly asteroids captured from the asteroid belt. And here's a Viking picture of Phobos, the inner and larger, which is less than 30 miles across, an irregular crater-scarred chunk of rock. Well, the Russians had a great idea of sending probes there, and they dispatched two. Phobos II was a, is scheduled to hover over Phobos and then actually land on the surface and hop around sending back information. But once again, uh, trouble intervened, it went out of control, we're not, we're not quite sure why, and nothing more was ever heard of Phobos II. So uh, we have no further information as yet about these two strange little moons, but certainly they wouldn't be of very much use in illuminating the Martian nights. The outer moon, Deimos, is even smaller than Phobos, less than 10 miles across. So, where do we go next? Well, we have a Martian base. Here's Paul Dirty's impression of a preliminary Martian base, but within the next few decades, we may have a fully-fledged station upon Mars. Although, of course, we can never turn Mars into a second Earth, and life there is going to be under very artificial conditions. Meanwhile, look at this. The Hubble Space Telescope picture of Mars, showing the red deserts, the polar cap, and the dark areas. And meanwhile, don't forget, Mars is there now, do go out and have a look at it tonight if it's clear, and it does hold out a challenge for us. And Mars must certainly be the first world to be reached after the moon. Before I go, don't forget, if you want the latest news, dial up our Sky Night information line, 0891-800-330. And the next month is our 500th Sky at Night, and we're going to take a look round the sky. And so until then, good night.